Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome once again to this uh, live video. My name is Nduta Wampura, and if you're listening to me uh, on this live video, please obviously let me know where you're listening in from. And um, if you have any questions, um, if you have any type of doubts, any type of thoughts that you would like to share, please make sure that you can leave them on the comment section and I'll be more than happy to answer them. I'll be more than happy to interact with you. So please let me know where you're listening in from, you know, what questions you have. It's all going to be about Erasmus today. So um, I have been meaning to do this live video for quite a long time now. And um, I mean, just because of um, the questions that you guys have been asking on my social media platforms as well. So if you are listening to this much later, obviously, I hope that uh, you find an answer to your question right here. And as the topic of today's discussion, um, you know, all about the rejection letters from Erasmus as well as any other questions that some people might be having um, you know in terms of having some doubts on you know how to apply for Erasmus Mundus joint master scholarships come uh, you know the next round which is going to be around from September end of September around October thereabout um, and application period is between that time all the way to next year uh, some time in February, some in March, uh, some days nowadays we have even in April, depending on the program, obviously. So uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Please feel free to interact with me. Hey, Prince, uh, good to see you there. Um, let me know where you're listening in from, what questions you have, what doubts you might be having, what thought processes that you might be having. So far, I know it's been a lot, a lot, a lot. And believe me, when I say it's a lot, I get this a lot from my inboxes, for sure, if I was to show you, um, as well as my emails, people saying, hey, you know what? I applied for this scholarship and somehow I was rejected. So can you help me? What do I do next? Um, is it that they hated me this much? Believe me you when I say I know how you feel. I know what you might be going through because, um, I mean, I've been there. I did not also get my scholarship the first time that I applied. So I know what exactly you might be going through. So please feel free to hang out with me uh, on this one hour, one hour and a half so that I can be able to point to you and let you know, um, you know, exactly what to do from here, uh, what might have happened and so on and so forth. So let's just get into it. So in the first place, I will divide this segment into three parts whereby um, I'll speak about those people who got rejection letters, others who got uh, on the reserve list um, and what to do in that case. I will also talk about in terms of application, what is the way forward? Um, should you reapply again? Should you just give up now? And then I will then answer all the questions that you might have right here. And the, uh, also the questions that I have also been receiving that might be um, you know, not yet answered. So let's go. So like I said before, um, if you got a rejection letter or you um, got a letter saying that, hey, we put on, your, on the reserve list, we really liked your application. However, we have had to put you on a reserve list. That usually happens. It's not you. First of all, take your mind off that, you know, they hated you They because you're from a certain country or maybe they were like, no, we don't want uh, applicants from this country and this other country. No. That is not how it goes. At least for most consortiums, usually, they do not have a quarter where they say that they want this exact number of people from a certain country. So you have to get that out of your mind for sure, 100%, because there are several reasons as to why maybe your application was not a good fit for them. And so this is very important to know that hey, it's not about you personally, it's about your application. So there are various reasons as to why your application might have been rejected. And I would like to tackle those um, reasons. One of the reasons would be, for example, maybe your documentation was not in place correctly. So in, in this case, what that means is maybe you did not upload certain documents. And when I say certain documents, in general, 
to apply for an Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's program, you would need one, your transcripts, you need your uh, degree certificate, you need things like residence, um, you know, certification, which you get from your area chief. You would need recommendation letters, your uh, SOP, um, you know, you would also need your CV. Some courses would also ask you for an English test, right? So if you did not check out all those boxes or you uploaded the documents in the wrong way or maybe you uploaded a certain document maybe you uploaded a cv where it ought you know you would have um, uploaded a degree certificate these things might have caused your application to be rejected because it means that you did not follow the instructions and um in the case of documentation whereby maybe there was a mistake with your document or maybe you were late with a certain document or perhaps maybe you need to re-upload a document it's very important for you to go ahead if you got a rejection letter it's very important for you to write to the consortium asking them hey can i be able to actually upload this document once again so that you can check my application which is also known as the appeal procedure really so if you get a rejection letter it's very easy to go ahead and um uh, do an appeal of that decision to the consortium. This is done uh, depending on the program. So, so each program has its own set of ways to do uh, an appeal procedure. And this appeal procedure could perhaps in most cases, what I have seen is that, you know, some people maybe you uploaded the wrong document, you have it correctly. And then now you say to the consortium, hey, I would like to re-upload uh, this document. So can I send it to you? Yes, some people have actually gotten in using the appeal procedure. So yes, you can definitely go ahead and appeal that decision. And especially if because if it was a documentation issue, you can definitely speak to them. And again, it's again to, 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 their, to their sole discretion. It can be either a yes or a no, and they will be like, okay, fine. Yes, upload once again, or no, we have completely uh, done our decision making here, and we are not able to take in, uh, you know, your appeal. So usually appeals happen um, within a certain period of time. And I'm just gonna share my screen quickly here so that you can see, um, you know, what I mean in by um, the appeal procedure. So again, this is very dependent on a program, right? So which means that, you know, every single time that you are applying for a program, you will see, you know, about the program, the admission criteria that they will have, uh, as well as the documentation that they need for that uh, particular program. So for example, this program is European Master in Tourism Management, right? So here uh, on this tab, they have the admission criteria. And uh, what I was talking about is the appeal procedure. So in this case, what they say here is for the appeal procedure, for them, applicants have the right to appeal against the selection decision and the reasons to appeal must be duly justified using the appeal form available uh, right here on this link. And the appeal form together with supporting documents if applicable must be scanned and sent by email to the EMTM secretariat or the consortium in other words, within 10 days after the selection results have been communicated. So the EMTM selection committee will respond within one month after reception of the appeal. And before appealing, please read carefully the information contained in the selection uh, in the sections admission criteria and application step by step um and again i mean they've given information of exactly what to do and what to expect and when they can give you a decision once you have appealed for uh you know for, for whatever the decision that was made so this is a very important point to note that if you got a rejection rejection letter and um, you know that uh, decision uh, the fact that you want to appeal that decision is very justified one i say if for instance it was the documents you can also appeal it if you feel that hey you are a good candidate but you don't understand us why you possibly were not picked up so it's very important to ask the consortium to verify the reasons as to why perhaps you're not picked up
And this brings me to my other point where, you know, the reason as to why you might not have been picked up would be obviously the quality of your application. And the quality of your application in this case melts down into, uh, you know, the points and the ranking that they gave your application when you are doing the application once again. So usually on the program website, you will see that this is the list of the eligibility criteria that they will be looking at during uh, when they are looking at all the applicants and they will be perhaps maybe uh, they have given a weighted average of maybe like the statement of purpose would be uh, equivalent to maybe 10% of your application. Uh, your CV maybe is going to be 5%, I don't know. Uh, maybe your um, the things that you've done, the projects that you have carried out, uh, the academic uh, papers maybe you possibly have written depends on a program 100%. Once this criteria uh, has been checked, by the consortium it's not a bot that checks this this uh, you know applications once they have checked and they have seen that hey maybe this person ranks higher than the other person right you can request the consortium to give you this grading so that you can be able to know exactly what maybe you fall you fell short of you perhaps maybe fell short of your statement of purpose you perhaps maybe did not write a very good uh, cv or maybe your recommendation was not strong enough as compared to other candidates. So this is very important for you to actually be able to understand and know that yes, you can be given this information. Some programs certainly just send you this information one-on-one -on -one without you having to ask for it. So it's important for you to uh, know that what grade did you get in a way that it's either you appeal that decision or you can be able to now prepare using those points for the next round because all is not lost for sure. You can definitely go ahead and apply for the next round um, and uh, shoot your shot. And I mean, you can also sh be shooting a shot in other programs. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily Erasmus for 100%. You can definitely shoot your shot in other programs within you, the European continent or any other continent, depending on the skill set that you have and what exactly you want to study. So I do hope that that is very, very, very clear. Right. And I, I can see you guys joining in uh, join um, here and maybe just uh, send in your comment and uh, send in your question, whatever else you want to, to, to ask in this session. I will definitely tackle it. Um, and I do hope that, you know, you get some value from this. Uh, I see you, Ethiopia, and uh, I see you asking. I've selected in one of uh, the Erasmus Mundus programs, but I have no idea about the subsistence cost. They will cover. Oh, well, this is very, very, very good. Congratulations to you. Um, I will, I will definitely be talking about this, um, and I will tell you exactly what the subsistence subsistence cost, excuse me, I have some allergies here that um, about the subsistence cost that they will be covering for you. So in this case, um, this is also stipulated um, in, in the letter that you will definitely receive. So usually they would be covering one, your uh, stipend. So the stipend, depending on the program you, you were taken in, I don't know which program that uh, took you in this case, um, usually, um, for the programs that began their contracts much later, uh, much earlier, I, I, earlier than 2021, I believe, would still have their stipend, monthly stipend being a thousand euros per month. And you would also have a traveling allowance, uh, at least 3,000 uh, euros per year. And they would also give you an installation uh, fee of uh, around a thousand euros uh, when you're beginning your program so that you can be able to settle in. Perhaps there are things you want to buy, etc, etc. They would also be covering your insurance as well as, uh, you know, your tuition fees for all the universities that you'll be going to. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and, and, and I believe that should answer your question. Um, yeah, so I believe that should answer your question. Um, and, you know, obviously this is something that would be on your acceptance letter. It would be stipulated on the acceptance letter so you can also check on that letter or also ask your consortium whether, you know, this, this is something that's covered or 
something else that's not covered. So you can clarify those questions with your consortium. Now, moving on, I would want to ensure that you uh, know also the other reason that perhaps maybe your um, um, application was pos possibly rejected could be the fact that maybe that program had a certain quota. So some programs you will see on their program websites, they have said that this year they are going to have X number of students whom they are willing to give scholarships. And the rest of the students perhaps maybe could do like a self-funding or they can choose to have other funding schemes that are either within that particular program or are within the universities that you know are stipulated so what do i mean in this case once you go to a program website usually um when you're applying within the period of erasmus scholarships which is between october uh general from october all the way to february sometime in march again nowadays it depends on the program and how they feel but ideally they should uh, run between october all the way to at least march to the very extent um and then they would give a decision after that so Usually, uh, the thing is, uh, once you are, um, you know, applying for, for this Erasmus scholarship, you are automatically, um, you know, an applicant of the Erasmus scholarship in between that particular period of October to March. Now, the thing is, you will see that in some programs, as you apply, as you apply for the Erasmus scholarship, you will see that there is uh, places where they have said, oh, we also have this funding. We also have this other funding, you know, and they, they'll give the names of the funding schemes that might be available for that same program that you can take advantage of, right? As much as maybe, just to maybe um, have as many options as possible. So this is also another option that you can take depending on the program so for instance maybe you you applied for the erasmus masters in tourism and you are not uh, given a, an erasmus scholarship you can check whether the universities that were um you know within that program so perhaps maybe it, it involves portugal spain italy honestly this is just an example maybe you can check are there maybe other scholarships that are within that particular university in Spain or in Italy or in Portugal that I can take advantage of and apply for and still do this scholarship um, and I mean do this program without Erasmus scholarship but with another particular uh, scholarship program. So this is something that you can do your own research and check on the program websites or on the university websites that are, you know, are, are participating in your program. I do hope that this is very clear because this is something that um, several people have been asking. So I've been reje rejected. So what, what does this mean? Can I still do this program? Yes, you can still do it if such funding schemes are available to you. Again, if you have the power, which is maybe the last resort here, so if you have the power, you can do a self-funded program. So which means that if you are able to pay the fee of the program, then you can take advantage of paying this fee and come and study. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you would need to speak to the consortium and see how that pans out, whether you can be able to stay in one university instead of moving from one university to the other, because as you may know, the master's programs at least um, involve two un European universities, which means that you have to move from one country to the other to study for the whole two years. So in this case, if you're doing a self-funded program, then you can also request to see whether it is possible in any, any program, whether it is possible to actually uh, be able to stay in one, be domiciled in one university in a way that, you know, that minimizes your cost in terms of uh, traveling, in terms of accommodation and just living in Europe, ETC, ETC. So this is another thing that you can be able to do and uh, be able to see what are your options, right? If you are in a position to actually pay for the school fees and all these kind of things, the insurance, uh, be able to take care of yourself, it's a lot. But this is the last, last, last resort. Otherwise, it's important to know that, you know, as much as you've been rejected, 
everybody, you know, like it's it's not like you would uh, expect that, hey, you've applied, you're thinking you're the best, you've been the A student, you've been the best in your university, etc, etc, then you apply for Erasmus and you're like, okay, what do they really want? Is it that they just looked at my application and they were like, no, this person, we don't want them? No, these criterias of, uh, you know, checking different applications, there is the funding, the amount of funding that each program has been given every single year, and they have to go by that, and as well as the quality of the application that you put up um, your, your statement of purpose, you know, what did you write there? Did you follow the instructions about the documentation? Did you also make sure that you are um, showing out yourself, um, you know, in terms of the subjects that they have requested, in terms of the fields that they have requested, and all these kind of things pan out all together into the decision making process. So it's very important to understand that it's nothing about uh, against you. So what I can say in this case is that if you, um, you know, maybe perhaps you, you, you decide you want to appeal and they say no, or maybe there's, there's no way you can go around it. Maybe it was not about documents for you. Then you can choose to now prepare so that you are able to apply for this next intake. And this is what I want to talk about today. And I do see uh, more people joining in. Welcome, welcome. So uh, yes, uh, someone saying, can you talk about Kenya? We have been waiting, no feedback, especially for Coast Hazard uh, program. There are no learning outcomes on website. Can we talk, talk about it? Uh, okay, Coast Hazard program, uh, still no uh, results yet. They will come, believe me you, they will come. By latest, by June, they will definitely uh, come. So you have to wait for this, um, but I will definitely talk about this. So um, again, this is, again, excuse me. I have been having this jitter, uh, but I hope they will go. Um, now, I will talk a little bit about that, uh, Remy, and I will go, what I can say as well, because I also have also been seeing people uh, on the Kenya community page asking, oh, okay, when are the results expected for this program? Why are we waiting for such a long period of time? Is it that we were left out? Is it that Kenyans we were left out? Is it that Nigerians are, um, you know, taking over and taking all the scholarships? No. One thing that you have to realize is one that Kenya we are a much, much, much smaller country as compared to Nigeria. So we can never compare ourselves with the Nigerian community. Believe me, there are more than two hundred million plus going, and we are what sixteen maybe 50 something million believe me you have not checked the census so don't uh you know come and crucify me for that but we are a much much smaller country as compared to nigeria and then again nigerian community usually um you know you would find that uh, most of them are really 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 uh into helping one another which is uh, possibly something that is not there in kenya because we don't have as many numbers as they do right so we don't have as many uh kenyan alumni erasmus alumni as they do so this is very important for you to understand that we can never compare ourselves to any other country because it's not like um erasmus has against something against kenyans no that's not the case so you have to take that out of your mind the other thing that you need to realize is that all programs will always 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 publish uh information about when they are potentially supposed to maybe have results out to the candidates on their program website. And without, actually, I'm just gonna quickly go into the cost hazard program right now. And I will show you um, what I mean, because again, uh, sometimes it's like, um, why are we not getting the results? Why are they not saying anything? You can even send an email to them and ask them, uh, what is going on, um, you know, with, uh, with, our, with our results. But believe me, you, they will 100% have to tell you what is going on uh, within no time. So I'm just going to go there right there. Uh, let me just share my screen and cost hazard. Uh, so cost hazards. Okay, so here we go. 
Uh, and this is a program website. So I'm just going to check the admissions and the application and I'll see what they're saying right there. Let's find out together. Uh, okay, so they say that the application deadline was 15th January, yes. Deadline for sending English test was this. Applications received above will be taken into consideration for academic uh, admission. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, okay, all uh, right, all right. Let me see what they're saying. Um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, 15th February, okay, let me see something else. Uh, they must have uh, something to do with their uh, structure or the, let me see, maybe I might be wrong. Let me just <laughs> find out together, uh, but uh, they should have it. They should have it for sure. Okay, it's noted it there. Um, I'm gonna go back to, the admissions tab. Okay. Uh, all right. All right. All right. Mm. Can I send my documents? Uh, when can I expect the outcome of my application? It's right there. All right. So we have an answer here. So we expect to inform all Erasmus uh, Mundi scholarship applicants before 31st May 2023. So there you have it. Right. So you've got to wait. <laughs> You have to wait until at least the 31st of May 2023 uh, about your outcome of the application for admission and scholarship. In case you will not be selected for a scholarship, you may uh, consider to pay the cost by other means. So please be very, 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 very patient. We are still in April. Um, so believe me, you, they will, when they say that they will do it, they will 100% do it and they are obliged to actually um, you know, put this information on their program website um, and they cannot leave you hanging. So uh, don't fret, uh, this is going to happen within no time. So um, I, I do hope that I have answered your question right there. So one other thing that I want to talk about now is about, so what next, right? So um, just before I go to the what next, there's something I want to speak about um, in terms of the reserve list. So because you might find like some people have been put on a reserve list and they are, um, you know, trying to maybe wonder, okay, so I'm on the reserve list. What are the chances that I would be taken in? Or what are the chances that the consortium would be like, oh, okay, yeah, we have a position for you. So come over and let's, let's, let's do this. So the chances are very, very high, very, very, very high. So one thing that you would want to notice is that you can even be called um, as late as maybe even July, right? There are people who drop off courses or you will find that there are people who maybe applied for one, two, three, uh, four courses and maybe they were successful in maybe two of them or three of them and they would need to drop out of one and take up the other. Now, if that happens in, in any type of course, then, you know, the thing that happens is that you would be, uh, the, the consortium would go to the reserve list and check who is on the top of the reserve list because uh, once you put on a reserve list, you'll be told you are number one, two, three, four, or uh, whatever the ranking you are on the reserve list, which means that if somebody actually drops off, then you would be called to go ahead and uh, take up that position. So that's very important to notice, right? So again, this is something that usually happens. I don't know whether people know about it or not, but um, I, I think this is something that also I possibly would need to show. So let me go ahead and share my screen once again. And so that you can be able to see about the reserve list. I'm just gonna use the same cost hazard. And I do see you saying, okay, speaking of learning outcomes, I mean the kind of degree whether joint something like that. Uh, I don't understand your question. Um, then, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and share my screen once again and let's find out. So give me one second. Uh, okay. All right, all right, all right. So let's see, my screen is sharing. Okay, so you're asking about uh, learning outcomes. 
and the kind of degree, whether joint or something of the sort. So yes, it's going to be a joint uh, uh, you know, degree. So in the first place, uh, actually, what you see on this website is that this is going to be between the University of um, um, University of Cantabria in uh, Spain, uh, the Netherlands, the Delft in the ne Netherlands, and the University of the Algarve in Portugal. So these are, um, you know, the three participating universities in this case. And um, what, what you are talking about, first of all, is the learning outcomes right here, right? So the learning outcomes, um, let me see. Okay, so it doesn't give information there, but uh, what I would say is go to the structure. Um, so as you can see on the structure of this is that the first semester is going to be in Spain, second semester in the Netherlands, and the third semester in um, Portugal. So the thing is, um, and then the fourth semester is going to be um, a thesis semester whereby you take a project and it can be in one of the three universities that are participating. Obviously, this depends on your supervisor. It depends on um, what exactly is the, is the structure of the program. But the thing is, usually what happens with these programs is that since you have uh, gone to study in the three universities, this is going to be a joint uh, program. So that is the reason as to why we talk about Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's Program. So all the programs are joint programs. And eventually what happens is that all the credits that you have earned in every of the university are usually count towards uh, your degree. You might find that this, some programs will give you three certificates, which means that you will have a, a maybe, a, I'm, I'm not saying this is what is going to happen with your program because I'm not familiar with what certificates that they give, but you will find that some programs will give uh, like three certificates, so one from Spain, another one from the Netherlands, another one from Portugal. Some others might decide that, hey, we're just going to give one document, one degree certificate, saying that you have uh, gone through this program and you have graduated from uh, University A, B, C, D, E, uh, and it's one document, depending on uh, actually uh, what they have decided that uh, is going to happen. I mean, usually they publish this. I do see that it's not available right now on uh, this um, because they say more information coming soon. So perhaps give them time as soon as they even are, uh, are able to give the results. And maybe when uh, you begin uh, studying, they give all the information that you need to expect from um, the program. So please don't be worried about that. But what you can know already is that the fact that you are able to actually get a joint program eventually. This happens for all the Erasmus programs. Now, what one thing that I wanted to talk about is about the reserve list. Perhaps this is not, um, I don't know whether this is actually a very good uh, place to uh, check the reserve list because usually most of the programs will say, um, you know, once they put you on, on a reserve list, then you can maybe uh, know which number or you are on that reserve list. I don't think this is... Uh, let me just see whether we have, I'm um, just going to check another uh, program uh, on the EMJM catalog so that you can be able to see. So the thing is, uh, you can be able to, uh, let me see, let me see. So I'm back to the catalog that everybody keeps on asking. So I'm just going to take a very random program and see whether they have said anything to do with the reserve list. Um, and, um, you know, uh, once I do that, then we can be able to move forward. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So here we have comments, election procedure. All right, all right, all right. Um, so they say that the application period here is over. They should be able to have a way where they have some program information um, and something to do with the scholarships and so on and so forth. Let's let's check the selection procedure. Um, and uh, yeah, so exactly, this is what I wanted to first have. So for this, they have the selection procedure, which is a very important section in any of the program websites, right? And the document check, first of all, is the fact that, you know, they will uh, be checking all the documents that they requested for you and whether or not you are able to actually upload them correctly. Now, if you have uploaded them correctly, then they would move on to uh, rank your application. And like I was 
was mentioning before, uh, each of the application is usually ranked depending on the skill that the admission committee is using. Um, the skill could be anything from zero to 100. Uh, other uh, committees would rank from zero to 20, others from zero to 10. It really depends on the program. And some of them might even rank A, B, C, D, E, uh, depending again, on the program. So for this particular program, they have told you very explicitly that, hey, we will rank your application according to one, your academic records. So your academic records will uh, amount to about 60%, uh, uh, at least 60 points of your application and the language skills 20%, your motivation and reference 10%, and any other additional elements. For instance, if you do have additional academic um, or research or professional experience, then this would uh, be uh, amount to 10% of what they are looking for. So depending on how your academics have been looking, how your language skills have been, uh, are, maybe the IELTS test what you did, uh, how many points you got, depending on the test that they were asking for, um, your motivation and reference. Uh, if you see, this is the statement of purpose that we keep on talking about, as well as the reference letters that you perhaps got from, um, your referees, these are very, very, very important key elements of your application. So now they have talked about the appeal procedure as well, uh, but they have not talked about anything to do with the, uh, you know, the reserve list. Whichever the case, what I will tell you for sure is that when you're put on the reserve list, you're given a number. And if somebody uh, happens to drop off from the course, then you can be able to go ahead and be picked up if depending on what number you are on that reserve list and uh, i mean the chances are uh, dependent again on uh, the availability so you cannot quite say that you you are putting all your eggs in that basket of waiting so what i would recommend is um if you see that maybe by sometime in August, there's nothing that you've not received an email saying that, hey, uh, we would like for you to come over and uh, do the course. Do you know what? Like some people actually even get these uh, emails as late as even September, depending on maybe somebody just dropped off uh, like the last minute and they have an opening and they have to fill that opening. So, if you don't get any email, I would say uh, uh, before the next application period, which begins sometime end of September, then I would say this is about time for you to go ahead and, uh, you know, um, apply once again, either for the same program or for any other program. So this is something that I also want to talk about now is the fact that, yes, you can reapply. It does not matter how many times that you have been rejected. It doesn't matter how many times you've been put on a reserve list. You can always, always uh, reapply. And you're not disqualified by any program just because you were not taken the first or the second time or the third time. So you can apply as, um, you know, once again. And what now to look out for is, uh, you know, one, you need to check whether your documents are in check. So I usually say that if you feel that your documents are not in place, if you feel that maybe you're not able to uh, maybe get uh, simple documents such as your passport on time, simple documents such as a recommendation letter on time, you know, don't apply for that particular period. Wait until you can be able to say that, hey, you know what? I have all the list of my documents checked Things like, for example, an English test, which takes quite a long time before you can book it, pay for it, uh, and then go ahead and maybe, you know, um, submit it to a program. It takes time. It takes quite a lot of time. So it's very important for you to ensure that all your documents are in check before, before you can apply for a program. So what do you do now? As you are listening to this right now, we are in April, September is very, 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 very soon. It's going to be like five months away. Let's even say four months away because we are almost at the end of uh, April. So what to do in those four months is to go through the catalog. As you saw, I was sharing my screen here. 
the catalog has about 193 programs now going. It's a lot. Now, what you need to do right now is to see what program is fit for you. And how do you know this? This depends on the skill set that you have, the knowledge base that you have, first of all, the experiences that you have had as well. Um, so it's time for you to take a pen and paper, or if you are those people who prefer to type somewhere, it's time for you to evaluate yourself and see, hey, you know what? This is what I would want to do for the reason as to maybe, perhaps maybe you even like, make for I'll give an example. Maybe you did an undergraduate in business, right? So you maybe went and did, if you're listening uh, from Kenya, maybe you went and did a Bachelor of Commerce. And then, you know, life happened, you graduated, and then you went into the job market and you are like, you know what? I think I love to do something in tech, right? And maybe you have been working in tech maybe for one year or even six months, it doesn't matter. Or maybe you are even in tech, by the time you are even graduating, maybe you have had an internship, maybe in a tech company or whatever it is that you were uh, you know, doing by then. And then you are like, okay, so what is my next step here? So you go to the catalog and you're like, you find a, a course and it's tech related and you're like, oh, this looks like something that I can do because usually with Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's programs, what happens is, is that they are very, very, very experience uh, related. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the fact that remains that sometimes it's not about what is on your paper, what is on your degree, what is on your, um, you know, maybe whether you had a first class owner or a second class owner. Sometimes it doesn't matter usually. Um, so what happens is that they check a lot about your skill set, your professional experiences, your maybe internship experiences, maybe your volunteer experiences. What experience are you bringing to the table that is very valuable, that stands out among all the applications that they have been receiving that makes you the best candidate for a certain program. Now, once you answer that question, and I will say it once again, so what makes you super outstanding? You have to think about this as, a, as an individual. What makes you super, super, super out, outstanding for a certain program, either because of professional experience or maybe your uh, internship experience, your volunteering experience, um, or uh, perhaps maybe uh, you know the job changes that you have had. Maybe it's a project that you have been running as a person, or maybe you have been um, in a certain project in your job market or a certain project in your university, maybe just before you graduate. What exactly sets you apart from every other candidate globally, right, uh, in a certain program? So how do you know this? First of all, is to read the eligibility criteria that has been mentioned on each and every program website that you are interested in. So you would go there and read the eligibility criteria, see, hey, they're looking for a candidate who maybe has uh, experience in chemistry or experience in mathematics or experience in some languages or maybe in education or teaching or these kind of things. So once you have read and digested that eligibility criteria, it takes time. It's not like a day thing, because as you have seen, the catalog has 193 programs. So one, you can be able to filter and see what, which fields that you're interested in, or you can decide, like I usually say, it's a lengthy process. I know the catalog is not, uh, you know, website is not the best uh, of the, websites that is existed out there uh, but what you need to check is you can go through all the programs all the pages and identify that hey this program this program this program do you know what you can apply for more than three programs nowadays so you can say maybe i mean obviously we don't expect you to apply for 20 programs because as much as your skill set would be as diverse Obviously, you cannot qualify for 20 programs at the same time, but you can check and see. Maybe you've seen three or four or five programs that you actually, you know, qualify for or would be interested in. Check the eligibility criteria of each and every one of them. Take your time. You have four months, right? Do not procrastinate because this is something that people always do. You're saying, oh, you know what? The deadline is going to be, oh, in, in 
they will only open in October and they, they will close in, in December. So half time where eh? you don't have time. You don't have time if you really, really want to do this. So what I can say is go to those program websites as early as now. Check those eligibility criteria points that you have put in right there. Put them down. Cross those ones that, you know, you possibly could cut you out, right? And then, write, start writing even your motivation letter as early as now. Like, you know, write it down and see, hey, uh, maybe I wrote a motivation letter. Maybe let someone else also check that motivation letter and tell you that, hey, you made a mistake here. You shouldn't mention this. Because as much as, you know, as people, we have lots of uh, skills. We have a diversity of skills. And not all the skill sets actually are relevant for a certain program. So this is very important for you to notice that you need to narrow down and say that, you know what, this program, maybe three programs or four programs or five programs, I can be able to write different applications, four applications or five applications, which are very different and showcase my skill set, my experiences my professional experience, my academic experience, my internship experience, my volunteer experience, etc, etc, I can be able to showcase them. And remember, put in mind what exactly the selection procedure is for each and every one of those programs, what exactly they're looking for, and put weight on that. So put weight, what I mean is that, for, for instance, if a certain program is saying that they will, um, you know, 60% of what you write on your statement of purpose is going to count for your, uh, you know, application. Then put weight and make sure that your statement of purpose is really on point, follows all the criteria in terms of the word count, in terms of, um, you know, perhaps some programs might give you a headline of what to answer. It gives pros. Make sure that on your statement of purpose, and I have spoken about this on this channel quite a lot, quite a lot, quite a lot. Make sure that, you know, your statement of purpose is not like telling a whole load of story. Like, I mean, we are Africans. I come from Kenya. And, you know, the thing is, we talk a lot and we think the way we talk is what is the way we should be writing. Right. And so we end up writing stories from all over the place. And we are like, oh, you know what? I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. And lots of irrelevances show up in how we write. So it's very important to gather your thoughts in a certain program and say that, you know what, this is what is motivating me. This is what is setting me apart as the best candidate for this particular program and this program and this program and this program. So all the, these applications would be different. So it's important for you not to just copy paste. You know, like I have seen, you know, I've seen lots of applications so far. And some people will just copy paste maybe the statement of purpose they wrote from for one program, they will use the same to the next program, to the next program, to the next program. And I'm like, okay, and then what do you expect from this? No. So that's why I'm telling you, you have time. You have four months to be able to check this information, digest it, and be able to see exactly what, uh, you know, would uh, be the best fit for you. So once you have done that, then make sure that you also start gathering your documentation as early as possible. In the first place, if you don't have uh, an international passport, this is one of the things that you have to have. So you would need to, again, make sure that you're doing the process correctly and you're going to, you know, Nyayo House or maybe it's if, if it's in Embu that you prefer to go to and, um, you know, you're going to apply for your passport as soon as you're listening to this now, 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 apply for your passport and then begin uh, checking the documents. If, for example, a certain program really needs you to have an English test, then make sure that you're doing that English test, right? If you are, um, you know, going to uh, have to get a residence, uh, proof of residence, which I've also talked about on this channel, as well as the Facebook community. If you are looking for a residence, um, you know, proof of residence, this is something that you can speak to your area chief or maybe your employer or maybe your landlord, or if you have a utility bill that is in your name, that which means maybe a water bill, an internet bill, an electricity bill. This is not something very common in Kenya, which is the reason as to why I say go to the area chief 
or go to speak to your employer or maybe perhaps maybe it could even be a lawyer who's uh, writes a letter saying that you have been living in a certain vicinity for x uh, number of years etc make sure those documents are put in place ahead of time such that when the program opens right you're very 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 ready to the extent that you have time to just uh, put everything together, uh, upload everything, um, and you're not rushing the very last minute. Because this is something, again, as Kenyans, we all, all, all the time, almost all the time, we're just rushing towards the very last minute. We're like, oh my God, the deadline is tomorrow. So tonight I have to sit down, make sure everything is done, and then what? It's a short application, and you end up regretting the reason as to why you did not take time. You have the time. You do have the time. So this is for people who perhaps you know you applied and you did not get the scholarship you possibly decided to appeal and maybe it was still a no or maybe you are in a reserve list and you have waited for enough period of time and still there is no email so then in this case it's time for you to reapply and i would say spread your wings as far and wide as possible so make sure that you are applying uh, for more than three programs in a way that you can um, have, you know, several options for you eventually, right? So this is something that you have to really, really remember. Otherwise, um, you know, you are equal to the task. I do believe that, you know, it, it doesn't matter who you are, what the experience that you show on paper, the experience that, you, remember you're introducing yourself in an application, whatever the application it is, you're introducing yourself to someone who's never met you, telling them that you are the best candidate that they would ever, ever meet who qualifies for a certain program as compared to everybody else who has actually applied. So please always remember that fact. And as I go to finish, I do hope that you are getting some value from this, obviously. So please make sure that you have, if you have any questions, because I'm going to go to the question and answer section very shortly. Um, and I will ask answer all the questions that I have been receiving so far. Um, I mean, obviously, I have answered quite a, a number of them already. Um, so I would hope that if you have a question, if you're listening to this right now live, please send in your question. Um, if you want to share this video with someone who could benefit from it, please feel free to share uh, this video, obviously. Um, if you want to maybe send me a comment later, go ahead and do that. If you're listening to this much later, obviously, go ahead and uh, uh, send in your questions, send in your comment, and I'll be more than happy to answer it. Um, so. The thing that I would want to actually go ahead and, and speak about before I go to the question uh, and answer section is the fact that, uh, you know, we always tend to not follow uh, the eligibility criteria. We also tend to uh, rush at the very last minute so it's important for you to actually also network with uh, some other potential people who have already gone through that program what i mean by this is the fact that um don't think that you know once you've written your your own statement of purpose of you've gone through your whole application and you think that you know what i think this application is the best of the best of the best let someone else criticize it for you um, so in this case, what I also would recommend in this case is to go ahead and check your LinkedIn, check your Facebook, right? Check for alumni who've gone through this program or check for current students who are actually studying this program. Why? You would learn a lot from these students and alumni because they've gone through the program already and you can make friends with them or make, make acquaintances with them and request them to check your application and see whether it suffices, whether it is good enough or you need to make something adjustments or you, maybe your statement of purpose is not up to task or maybe your CV, you've not written it correctly. Usually we say, if you want to write a CV for, uh, you know, your application, then it's recommended for you to have a Europass format. Some programs do not explicitly want this. It's, um, you know, you can you can go ahead and check that information once again on the program website as to whether or not a certain program is actually requesting for you to write your CV on a Europass format. Again, this is something that you can do now as you listen to me so that you're not rushing at the very last minute right so one other thing is the fact that 
as much as I'm talking about Erasmus here, I'm always very passionate about talking about other European programs. You can always as well be applying for other programs, master's programs, because your end goal in this case is for you to do higher education abroad, right, in Europe for in this case. So you can always also check other scholarship programs that might be going on. I always go on Twitter sometimes and just post whatever uh, programs that I have seen that are open. So this could be in countries like Germany, in the Netherlands, um, you know, in the UK as well, um, you know, Spain, Portugal, it can be pretty much anywhere right? And you can be applying for those programs. You never know. You could be taken. I usually say, yes, Erasmus is the most generous uh, program that I was privileged to actually go through. And it's, it's one of the generous programs that I have seen in Europe as well. Now, it, as much as it looks lucrative as well, there are also other programs that would open you up the same way, uh, you know, to a certain extent, uh, the same way as Erasmus does. So, you know, you can go ahead and check like government programs within the 27 member states. And I have a pinned post actually on my Twitter that you can check that, you know, can tell you more about uh, some programs that, you know, you can apply for in this case. So now I do hope that um, so far so good. And I just wanna go to the question and answer section. Usually I do one hour in this session so that you know, you're know you not overwhelmed with information because some people, uh, I mean, I, I, I usually get overwhelmed myself with a lot of information. So I just want to make sure that you, know, you are listening in. If you want to come back and check this video and listen in once again to my voice telling you that yes, you can do it. Yes, you can reapply. I am here to whip that whip for sure uh, and let you know that yes, it's possible for you to reapply. This is not the end, whether you received a rejection letter, whether you, you received a reserve list, this is not the end for you, you still can do it, right? So one of the questions that I have uh, actually received uh, recently was, does Erasmus fund PhD? And I, I mean, this is a question that I have received over and over and over and over again. So um, one of the things that I will tell you is that Erasmus used to have PhD programs. Used to is a key word here. Used to uh, have joint doctorate programs, which are no longer happening. This stopped quite a long time ago, actually. Um, and so what you can do if you want to study a PhD, you can look for EU-funded programs which uh, could be perhaps maybe whatever the member state it could be really you can look for uh, eu funded programs and where do you look for this i have talked about this website before it's called euraxis website and the euraxis website i'm just going to leave a quick comment there it's um you know the euraxis website will give you uh, an overview of uh, open programs for phd and this um you know would help you in knowing exactly where to check for uh, a PhD. It, it would be maybe um, fully funded for sure. Usually they come in as jobs, so you can check out for this. You can also check for things like intra-Africa mobility programs, which cover uh, research, uh, PhD research. Uh, you can also check for uh, academicpositions.eu, which is also another pro, uh, you know website that I have talked about on this uh, you know platform, um, my YouTube channel. Again, you can check um, and rewatch and see what works for you. So this is something that you can also check out. Um, and so Erasmus does not fund uh, PhDs. I want to make that very very clear. But there is EU funding uh, for PhDs. This would be funded by, um, you know, programs such as Horizon 2020. You can check out, uh, other, uh, research, um, you know, platforms that have also been able to uh, publish some programs like findaphd.com. All right. My next question here is about, uh, the monthly stipend and whether it's enough. So, I mean, I think I spoke about it before. Um, the, Erasmus monthly stipend is usually a thousand euros. Usually, it depends on which city that you go to and whether this is going to be um, something that is an issue in terms of, for example, because Erasmus does not cover accommodation, which means that you would need to look for your own accommodation in the different city that you go to. Some cities are more expensive 
than the other cities. So this is something that you have to really, really be careful about. Like I mentioned before, when you begin the scholarship, the thing is, is that uh, you will be able to receive a 3,000 euro in, um, in, in uh, travel allowance per year, as well as an installation cost of a thousand euros, as well as stipend of a thousand euros, right? So that's at the very beginning. And to uh, just actually to, um, you know, make sure here that there are other programs which have signed contracts in the recent past that are giving a flat rate of 1,400. What that means is that that 1,400 would uh, be also the, the money that caters for your uh, travel allowance as well as the installation cost. So it's 1,400 per month for the two years. So if you do the math, this is actually at, at least, uh, I think it was 1,600 more than, than, than um, you know, the previous uh, structure of the financing. So this is something that has been happening already for the newer programs that have signed contracts uh, very recently. So again, make sure that you can check out on the web program website how much to expect. And what I can say is that make sure that, you know, uh, as much as you are going to a, a maybe a more expensive city than the other, then you can do what we call financial management. So make sure, making sure that you are, um, you know, saving up more in the less expensive cities and so that you can be able to get ready for the other cities that you go in to right so um that is something that you have to really really know um one other thing is uh someone talked said talk about the mobility of of erasmus and maybe this is, will be my last question because the other questions are like very generic uh, about application and all these kind of things so um now the mobility of Erasmus is the core of Erasmus Move to Strange Pastors programs, really. So the thing is, um, you know, uh, these programs come about with uh, the fact that um, it's important for people to actually move around uh, Europe, the European continent, which means that each of the programs will involve at least two of the European universities in the member states. So which means that um, every program will have some sort of mobility, which means that um, these programs are for two years, right? So those are four semesters. So in each of the four semesters, you would be moving around, which means that, for example, maybe your first semester, you guys, I honestly don't know what happened, but I just hope that, uh, yeah. So I was talking about mobility and the fact that you would be able to go from one country to the other. And I just hope that, um, you know, um, you know, this this makes sense to you that the first semester you go to one country, the second semester you go to a different country, the third semester as well the same, and the fourth semester is a thesis semester where you choose to either go back to the country, uh, either of the countries that you went to for the first, second or third semester. So this is something that is also on the program website. So you can check that out, um, you know, um, so that you can understand the mobility in a more uh, better way. Now, I do hope that uh, I have answered all the questions so far. If you have any other questions, uh, please make sure that you can uh, send it on the comment section so that I can check it out. Um, and I would hope to see that, you know, you are uh, somehow encouraged by this video, honestly, and you are not giving up uh, just because you got a rejection letter. I don't know whether you still have any questions as I go to finish. Please uh, send it on the comment section right now. And, um, you know, I will definitely go ahead and answer it. But I do hope that you have that kick uh, to help you to go ahead and uh, um apply once again. So this is not the end for you. The message is quite clear from me. So it's, it's not the end. Uh, you can shoot your shot once again. You can learn from, um, you know, the feedback that you get from any of the consortiums. You can learn from the feedback that you actually get even from your friends or from people who actually check your uh, application and let you know that, hey, you know what, this uh, and this and this and this is not correct. You need to correct this. You need to correct your CV or maybe 
your um, you need to correct uh, whatever it is really on your application that you need to correct, then please make sure that you can listen to them. Seek their advice. It always helps, honestly speaking. So please, I do hope that this um, little video has given you that kick. And I do hope that, you know, in case you do have any other questions, please make sure that you can join in the Erasmus Kenyan chapter group on Facebook. Or if you want to reach out to me directly, you can always reach out to me on any of my social media handles. Um, and let me know if you 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 would be shooting your shot once more um, and maybe check out also other scholarships that might be useful to you. Share this video if this information is not necessarily for you. You can share this video with someone else who might uh, benefit from it. Uh, it could be somebody who just graduated, someone who's waiting to graduate, someone who wants to do a career change, someone who just wants to really just experience Europe. Uh, this would also be a way for them to experience it. So um, make sure that you can share this video with someone who can benefit from it if this information is not for you. So please, um, once again, thank you so much for hanging out with me this one now. It's been amazing. Despite the tech issues, I don't know what happened in the middle of it. Despite my allergies here uh, and there, I do hope that this um, you know, has been of value to you. And I, I hope that you uh, stay subscribed. Uh, make sure that you can... Um, stay on ask the questions and i'll be more than happy to answer them uh, for you so until next time have a good evening good morning good afternoon wherever you're listening this from uh if you're listening to this much later as well uh, i do wish you all the very very best and i do hope that you don't give up really don't give up on this journey because it's a long journey it can be quite a long journey it can be a very draining journey but you got this you got this you can do it you can go ahead and apply it again and again and again until you get in and you don't have to fret you don't have to give up just in the middle of it um yeah and that's the much pep talk i can give you so once again my name is Juta Wambura. i'm the kenya country representative for uh, erasmus uh, mood association so um if you also want to check uh in the with the erasmus mood association if you're listening to this and you are already a successful candidate so make sure you can check out uh the association and see whether you can be able to benefit from it um and join the community once again so have a good evening good morning good afternoon wherever you are i do hope that you have a good and bye.